science guy, I study stats and data science in college, and, you know, play a lot of fantasy football, of course, so I was curious to see how these running backs would, you know, shape up under, you know, thorough analysis of their per-touch efficiency, and so I took a list of the top 50 running backs from last year in terms of, uh, I want to say volume, and, you know, I put them into a spreadsheet, and with this spreadsheet, I was able to create a few different metrics. The first one was um, total offensive opportunity. So what I did for this one was I just took a running back's number of carries that they had last year, and then I added in the number of targets that they got, because yes, well, not all the targets materialize, this is how much the offense was hoping to involve them in the year. Then, obviously, total touches is an easy one, where I took the number of carries, and then I added the number of catches. This is how much they actually got their hands on the ball in the offensive side of the field. Then, after that, I have a metric that is yards per touch. This is how many yards they were able to amass, both in the rushing game and in the receiving game. So it's the rushing yards plus the receiving yards combined, divided by their total number of touches. And so this gives you a loose way of tracking efficiency for your running backs. And so after that, I broke them up into different uh, ranges of efficiency, and I ranked them based on the number of touches they had and then their efficiency. So, in this video, we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, an 8 tier, tier list. And here are the names of the tiers. We've got number 1, elite and efficient. Number 2, just efficient. Number 3, underrated. Number 4, volume gangs. Number 5, average. Number six, overrated. Number seven, below average. And finally, at number eight, we have trash. So, before we get into this, I just want to remind you, this is purely based on the numbers. This has nothing to do with their situation heading into the 2024 year. This is not a ranking based on skill or talent or, you know, anything intangible. This is just based on their produ production last year and how many touches it took them to get to that. And so, uh, please, please do not come for me as like, uh, this is what I think. This is not what I think. This is just me beating them into different bins based on the numbers. And yes, I guess you can criticize the title of the tiers if you don't agree with it, and that would be completely fine. But uh, I more so just want to share what I have found because it is quite interesting. Uh, it's kind of obvious at some points and then at other points. Very fascinating. Okay, so first up we have the elite and efficient category and the running backs that go in this tier have to follow two rules. Number one, they had to have seen at least 300 offensive opportunities. And once again, an offensive opportunity is either a carry or a target. So how involved were they in their offense last year? And if you're getting over 300, it means very, you are a feature guy. And that is like the elite part. The efficient part is they had to have a yards per touch higher than five. So yards per touch, once again, is every time they touch the ball, how many yards did they get out of it? And a touch counts as either a carry or a catch. So it's all of their rushing yards, all of their receiving yards put together and then divided by how many times they touch the ball. And if it's over five, that means every time that this person is getting the ball, you're getting at least five yards of elbow out of them. And for them to be getting the ball nearly 300 times in the offense, that is really good. These are the best of the best. And so, there are three running backs in this category, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to list all of 
the note because it's going to make so much sense to you of why things are the way they are once you hear these names. So, this is in order, by the way. Number one, Christian McCaffrey comes as a surprise to no one. Number two, B. John Robinson, you know, Atlanta Falcons running back. Uh, and number three, Breesol. <laughs> so, your consensus fantasy ADP top three running backs are there for a reason. These are the guys that saw the most volume and the most efficiency. If you've ever wondered why Robinson and Breesol are in that, like, oh, everyone is so gaga about them in fantasy, this is why. Um, and so, just based on their 2023 numbers, if they are able to keep this up, it will translate into a lot of fantasy success. Then, let's move into our second tier. This is the just efficient category. These are guys that saw not quite as much, like there were three down backs for sure. Um, they saw between 250 and 299 touches, and they did maintain over five yards per touch, but they just didn't see the same number of uh, offensive opportunities. They saw, sorry, yeah, between 250 and 299 offensive opportunities, not touches, and uh, yeah, so slightly less of a workload, but still efficient guys, and they, if they see an uptick in usage next year, could be very elite. So, first up, James Cook, Buffalo Bills running back. Second is Jameer Gibbs, running back of the Lions. And third is Kyron Williams, Los Angeles, Los Angeles Rams running back. Um, and I feel like this also, this, this one is a little more interesting to me because I didn't know that James Cook was efficient like that. Uh, I didn't know that he was that good, in my opinion. Like, I knew he had a breakout here, uh, but I, I didn't realize that he was getting that amount of workload and that good with it. And so, just in terms of going into next year, I know that this video is more reflecting on last year than talking about next year, but we can take what we've learned from last year and apply it to the future. So, James Cook, hearing about this, and then knowing that Damian Harris is gone and Naeem Hines is gone, that's actually crazy. Uh, I feel like from a fantasy perspective, he might be priced kind of low. I, I would like to know more about James Cook in fantasy leagues, um, be more familiar with him in my drafting process. And then as far as Gibbs and Williams, uh, I think Gibbs, I was more so surprised he qualified for this. I didn't realize that he saw over 250 offensive opportunities, uh, which is a lot considering that he was playing backfield work with David Montgomery, but I guess the Lions offense was so good and they were on the field so often that they were able to generate so many touches for both guys or so many opportunities for both guys. So Gibbs was on the field more than I realized. If that number goes up this year, then uh, that would be huge. But you know, once again, David Montgomery is involved, so there is always that concern. Uh, if they can keep the offense at the same level, if they are going to increase Gibbs' role or not. I think through the first couple weeks last year, he was more so limited uh, in their offensive scheming, but, you know, it, it makes sense why Jameer Gibbs is being drafted as high as he is, and I feel like he's a very talented guy, so if he, if he got more looks, I, I would think it's in the Lions' favor, but I know that they also want to keep him young and fresh and give defenses a different look, uh, and then Kyron Williams, and yeah, this is no surprise, Kyron Williams was extremely efficient last year, absolutely uh, a breakout star of the, you know, Rams running back room, everyone thought Cam Akers was going to be the guy, Cam Akers year in, year out, it looked like he was actually poised to take over, and then Kyron Williams kind of came out of nowhere and swept up that role, and did an amazing job, so very efficient indeed, we'll see if he can get the same number of touches, and we'll see what kind of, like, defensive schemes he faces this year. Uh, I don't know if Blake Corum is going to be more involved or not. That is hard for me to say. I, I don't know how McVay is going to roll the dice on that one, but, uh, yeah, that tells us what we knew about Williams, that 
less than 250 opportunities on the offensive side of the ball, but still they were able to produce over 5 yards per touch, so they were not as featured. These were guys that, yeah, maybe they saw a decent amount of work, but uh, on their, like, more so limited touches compared to the other guys, they were able to do great things. And so, first up in this category, we've got Devon Achan, uh, or Achan. Um, and yeah, I, I think that most people know this. He saw less than 150 touches, I think it was 140 uh, opportunities, not even touches, he saw 140 offensive opportunities, but he led the league in rushes over 50, 40 yards. Uh, he was a huge, big play threat, and I think that's why everyone is so high on him going into the next year, because if we see him crash into like a, a regular running back workload that goes crazy that he, he could have a absolutely breakout season uh, if we see him use kind of like Montgomery and Gibbs where he can get to actually like a over 200 touch uh, or maybe even over 250 opportunities he could go absolutely ballistic then number two we've got Tyshae Spears of the Tennessee Titans. Now this is very promising um, if you have been looking at Tyshae Spears in fantasy just because yeah, I knew that in the pass catching game he was doing well. I, I knew that his volume was on the lower side but for him to be here um, it, it shocked me. I, I will be completely honest with you. I didn't know that he was like that in the efficiency game. So, with Derrick Henry gone, yeah, of course you're going to see an uptick in Tajay Spears' touches in this backfield. Um, and that's something that you have to be very happy about. Uh, year two, year two running backs usually, that's still a good time for them to break out. So, if you're in a later round and you're trying to get Tajay Spears, yeah, uh, it would be a very good idea based on this. Then, number three, we've got a very similar situation. Jalen Warren. Uh, Jalen Warren, the running back off the Steelers behind Najee Harris, more involved in the pass catching game. Uh, honestly, just the same thing. He is efficient. He just does not get the ball as much. He has led the league in, like, a few different efficiency metrics in, like, the last three years. So, we are just patiently waiting to see if he will ever be more involved a solid handcuff. He is a solid split touch guy. Uh, he doesn't provide enough on his own just yet, or like he didn't last year, but it's right there. If, if they give him more, if they just gave him more to the offense, he could probably do really well. Uh, but Najee Harris is kind of that guy in Pittsburgh, and you know, they, they spent a lot of capital to get Harris, so it's going to be hard to take away touches from him and funnel more into Warren, but, uh, yeah, um, you know, productive guy. Then, going in at number four in this is Aaron Jones. Uh, and now Aaron Jones was heavily limited last year by uh, a plethora of injuries, so we didn't get to see his regular number of uh, opportunities or touches or anything like that, but when he was on the field, he was good. And this is something that I actually saw recently regarding the Green Bay Packers running back philosophy. Um, you know, obviously this year they phased out Aaron Jones, they brought in Josh Jacobs, but they're not a team to just hammer down one guy. The reason why Aaron Jones was so viable in fantasy all those years was because he's been efficient. He's always been a pretty efficient back, and that was no different last year. It, the only, like, thing separating him from being higher up on this list was the fact that he couldn't stay on the field. He had a lot of injuries uh, lingering around on that season, but you know, um, if he is able to put together out this season, he could do a lot of damage out of that Minnesota backfield because Sam Darnold, I feel like, is going to need that dump-off pass option. It is going to be um, like a security blanket for him, and if he's generating five yards per touch, you know, just a few targets per game, and I, I like 15 carries. That's, that's great. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, we'll see. 
see we'll see how much they use them. Anywho, after that, moving into the next running back in this category, we've got Brian Robinson Jr. And um this kind of like follows up what I was saying in my sleeper mock draft video where Robinson has proved that like the, the crazy thing about Brian Robinson Jr. is if you look at how many catches he had versus how many yards he had. He was averaging over 10 yards a catch last year um, as a running back. So his average is crazy. Yes, he only had like 36 catches. And so his, his efficiency is a bit inflated off of that. But like the guy is good in both phases of the game, uh, running the ball and catching the ball. And so honestly, I think he does have like a decent upside to him and he has an edge over Eckler. Like Eckler is not going to necessarily take over uh, and dominate in this passing game. It's not like that is a flaw to Brian Robinson Jr.'s game. Yes, they're going to split touches, but Robinson has, has been good and so I, I estimate that he's going to continue to be good and if Eckler does go down, we could see him really take off. Um, uh, I think that Eckler is really just going to be in that, like, Antonio Gibson position. Um, but yeah. Then, the next running back in this category, the underrated category, we've got James Conner. Uh, and uh, another guy who I recently talked about in that sleeper mock draft video, James Conner, him being up here. Also, surprising to me, I didn't know that he was efficient. I thought that he was seeing volume, but for him to actually be not seeing that much volume more, just making the most out of what he has, is, it's nice to see. Um, you know, just James Conner's story and his, where he's been in the league and all that, uh, he's a guy that I like to see succeed, and so for him to be this high up, yeah, I, I like being able to keep James Conner the title of underrated. We'll have to see next year how much of this workload, like, I don't know if it can increase all that much with them bringing in Trey Brinson, but James Conner, you know, good on him. And then after that, we've got running back off the Miami Dolphins, Raheem Mostert. Uh, and yeah, Mostert, also very fast, had a surprisingly good year considering how old he was. Uh, I think he was 31 inning in the last year. But so 240-ish offensive opportunities, so it was just barely making the cutoff for this. Um, on the higher end of the number of looks, same goes for James Conner, but yeah, these guys, they were seeing almost enough to be in that conversation with, like, Kyron Williams, Jameer Gibbs, James Cook type of um, volume, and they were still doing great things with the ball, um, getting at least five yards every time they touched it. So, uh, shout out Loster, and he also had like 20 touchdowns last year, so I don't know about his age, but in terms of like how he did, he, he might be a good value back, um, heading down the stretch, you know, Devon Ajan, if they can do a RB1, RB2 type thing like they do in Detroit, they both could be very viable in fantasy, and yeah, then last guy in this category is actually shocking to me, uh, just because, like, I guess I was unfamiliar with this game, but the last running back in the underrated category is Ty Chandler of the Minnesota Vikings, um, which I, I was not expecting whatsoever. Uh, now, he did barely creep into this posting just above five, but I, if, if this is truly the case, I don't know why they rode with Madison for so long last year, because Alexander Madison was a, a stink show, in my opinion. He got a, a good amount of volume, but he was horrible in efficiency, as we'll get to later, but Bro was just eating up space on the offense, and if Ty Chandler was this good, uh, well then, you have a pretty solid running back room with Jones and Chandler from an efficiency standpoint, so, yeah, uh, in terms of guys 
guys that have running back rooms that have two guys mentioned so far. You've got the Miami Dolphins, and then you've got the Minnesota Vikings. So Vikings backfield might actually be underrated as a whole. Um, they they can produce off not even that many touches. Now we'll have to see if the Vikings even get to run the ball this year with everything going the way that it's going for them. I feel like the injuries have already fully piled on. Like they are, they already need another year to get healthy, and it's very sad. Um, so I'm not expecting high things out of this Minnesota team. I, I feel like they're going to be behind in most of their games. They're not going to get to run the ball, but um, it's, a, it's a darn shame because this backfield, both guys being posted up here, couldn't have guessed. All right, and so with that, we conclude our third tier, which was the underrated running back category, and we get to move into our fourth. And our fourth one is something that I have titled Volume Kings. The Volume Kings tier is filled with running backs that saw over 250 offensive opportunities, but they logged a yard per touch between 4.5 and 4.99. So, these are guys that like, they're getting a good amount of volume, and they're posting an average output. Like, it's not something that is to be looked down upon. I think it's it's a very fair range what they're what they're posting is like what you expect out of the typical running back. And they're just able to produce more because they're getting the ball more in their offense. So like their involvement is higher and therefore they're putting up good numbers. But it's not necessarily that they were you know, uh, yeah, they weren't efficient. They were just doing their job well. They're like workhorse backs. Uh, you can think of this as workhorse guys. So, first up in this category, we have Isaiah Pacheco of the Kansas City Chiefs. He posted the highest efficiency in this tier, uh, coming in at like 4.73. So, a decent notch below 5 like the others, but for the amount of volume, like, this is pretty good. You know, this is what you want out of your running back if you can be in this tier then that is very admirable i think that is they're doing their job well then after that you've got deandre swift um deandre swift of the eagles last year did see quite a few offensive opportunities and it would have been nice if he could post something a bit higher just because everyone knows how good the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line is. So, um, a bit of a shame, but still very good on his end. You know, he, I think, revived his career a bit. Uh, was a bit of a disappointment through all those years in Detroit. I think he had a good year, and then it was just like injury after injury. And then they got rid of him, and it was like a big shock, but. In hindsight, it was a good move for Detroit and even a good move for Swift because he was able to go to Philadelphia and have a very nice year for himself and then sign a good contract with the Chicago Bears. And now he can help them with their rebuild. And, uh, you know, the Bears, their offensive line isn't bad either. So I would say that he looks to be in a similar spot this year where he's going to be producing and it just depends on how many touches they give him. Uh, he'll produce like an, an average amount. <laughs> anyway, after that, we've got Kenneth Walker, third. Uh, Kenny Walker. And he being here, I think, is a good sign because I want to say that he crosses into more offensive uh, output. Just the way that they've been talking about him, I think that they're going to utilize him more in the passing game, and that is a big plus. So, in terms of efficiency, I can't say that he would be more efficient, but I think that, like, no guys in this range saw over 300 um, offensive opportunities, or even, yeah, yeah, they, they saw a decent amount of volume, but, like, we could see more volume from Kenneth Walker because uh, Zach Charbonnet 
he had his fair share of touches as well in this offense, and I feel like they're downgrading him and upgrading Walker as much, so the volume could be even more elite. He was already a volume king. He could be seeing even more volume, and um, that is something to keep track of. Anyway, after that, we've got Austin Eckler. Uh, now, I will say I was a bit surprised that Austin Eckler made this part of the list, because I know that he was hurt for part of last year. Um, I guess I just, in my mind, he was hurt for longer than he actually was. And, yeah, um, he, I, I think that he goes down, um, to say guy that his, his biggest thing was volume, especially in the passing game. He wasn't a guy that was going to give you a lot of rushing yards, but in the passing game, he saw a lot of targets and things like that. And now that he's changing teams, and I think that Brian Robinson Jr., when you look at it, seems like a better passer, uh, pass catcher. Eckler is going to see this go down, so he's not even going to be a volume king, so he's not, like, incredibly efficient. He's fine, but with a volume downtick, there's no reason that I would draft Austin Eckler. Um, it's really just, like, I think it can only get worse for him from where you draft him. Uh, his offensive looks are only going to get worse as the season progresses. And then after that, we've got Richard White of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and this is, like, the guy that comes to mind when I think of this category of volume king. Richard White is not efficient. He is less inefficient than I thought. I, I think prior to last year, it's really just the uh, receiving game that saves his numbers. As a rusher, he is not good. He is pretty inefficient. But as a pass catcher, he is able to balance that out, and so he was able to be in this category. Um, and he is just a guy that, like, they feed him. They really do feed him, so he's able to be as productive as he is, but he's, he's, he's decent. Like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how exactly to put it, but he's very volume dependent. He's not a guy that's blowing you away with his talent, necessarily, but with the ball in his hands, he gets the right thing done often enough, especially in the passing game, uh, running the ball. They, they just happen to keep feeding him. I am surprised that they're not bringing someone else in, but honestly, he had a good year for himself. Hey, after that, you get to Travis Etienne Jr. And honestly, Etienne Jr., when you look at his numbers, he is kind of just a Rashad White. Like, the things separating White and Etienne are not all that much. Um, both guys posted like almost a thousand yards rushing or like Etienne maybe barely crossed it but it was a small difference and in the passing game like they they just get a lot of touches that are not that far apart from one another very similar build um in terms of running back which is weird because in my mind like I think of Etienne as someone that I I view as, like, viable in fantasy, and I am biased against Rashad White, and I think it's more so for, I know that his rushing is so inefficient, and I trust Tampa Bay less, I guess, um, but it's strange to see how, like, similar they are, uh, when it comes to this efficiency. Anyway, after that, we go into Jerome Ford of the Cleveland Browns, uh, and yeah, Jerome Ford stepped into a role because Nick Chubb went down. Don't know when Nick Chubb is going to be fully healthy and ready to return to something like that, uh, like he was. Jerome Ford is going to be in the mix, but I think he's less touches. There's no reason to try and mess with that clay front rounds so backfield. Um, because, yeah, we don't know. Anyway, after that, we've got Joe Mixon of now the Houston Texans before the Cincinnati Bengals, and I think that this makes sense. I do think of Richard White, Travis Etienne Jr., and Joe Mixon as three very similar types of running backs where you can give the ball to them and they will go and get a decent amount of yards in the rushing game, but it 
is their dual threat ability. They're a guy that can run and pass. They're not a big bodied running back that is going to be bulldozing people down. So I don't think of them as like scary rushers, but they can run it and they do get like three down work. Um, yeah, Joe Mixon is right there with those guys. Um, I just liked how these guys got grouped together because when I was thinking of running back groupings I do think of them as like naturally kind of similar and to see them get grouped like this it was cool and then finally the last running back in the volume king category is Alvin Kamara and I feel like that also just fits the mold so well he's a guy that you can't hand the ball off to in the running game and it's going to be decent like I think he has gotten worse as a rusher but in the passing game, he provides a lot of upside, and so they utilize him a lot more as a pass catcher, and that is Boyd. Keeps him afloat in this volume te territory, in this conversation. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just interesting to see how these all pan out. But with that, we have concluded our volume king category, and we won't go into the average tier, average category. The only difference between this and the Volume Kings is how much offensive opportunity they saw. So, the Volume Kings, they saw over 250 offensive opportunities. These next guys, they saw less than 250. So, this is just an average running back in the NFL, uh, an average workload. They're not seeing anything too extravagant, and they are giving you your expected production. Not quite a efficient level of production, but not inefficient in, in between 4.5 and 4.99 yards per touch. So, first in this category, we have Khalil Herbert of the Chicago Bears. Now, I honestly was a bit surprised by this. I, I think I'm just caught off guard by Successful the Bears were at running the football with the guys that they had um, For him to be an average running back like I, I don't I don't think of him as bad or anything like that. I just Really it's it's surprising that the Bears put up as many rushing yards as they did um, It only makes sense because of their quarterback with Justin Fields and so Yeah, Herbert being here I don't know, I guess just got me by surprise. Anyway, after that, we've got David Montgomery, and this to me makes sense. He is a guy that will put his head down, run through the hole, not not getting a ton of touches, um, getting a decent amount of work, but he is your prototypical standard running back. Um, and it's funny to see that like David Montgomery, who used to be on the Bears, follows up right behind the, the Bears running back. <laughs> Yeah. After that, we've got Rico Dowdle. Uh, Rico Dowdle on the lower end. I think he had like the fewest offensive opportunities of anyone coming in at like 111, so quite below the 250 threshold. But he is just an average guy. Um, and so heading into next year, it's just about how much he sees. I don't think that he's going to see enough touches to be considered like a volume king. But uh, worth keeping in mind that he at least is average in his efficiency, uh, because we will get to the rest of the Cowboys backfield a little later. Then after that, we've got Zach Charbonnet of uh, the Seattle Seahawks, and Charbonnet got nothing wrong with him. I think people were expecting bigger and better things out of his rookie year. Uh, more. Like, I don't know, I, I heard a lot of hype about him, and there was more of a risk of him cutting out of Kenneth Walker's job, but he didn't do all that much. Uh, didn't see as many touches as people were thinking, and didn't, wasn't incredibly efficient or anything, so um, if we truly do see some taken away from him and given to Kenneth Walker, then, uh, you know, all the more reason to go out and draft Kenneth Walker in, like, fantasy drafts. And then we've got... Jonathan Taylor, um, I think the 
this make sense? Jonathan Taylor posts the injuries and things like that. This is how I think of him as an average guy. I I know that he was injured for part of last year, and so Zach Moss did take over, but at best he becomes like a volume king guy. He's not being that efficient, and so personally I don't like peaking him in as high in those drafts. Um, just because you know that Anthony Richardson is going to be a, a dual threat quarterback. He's going to be running in a lot of touchdowns and things like that. So I feel like the upside with Taylor is just less. He's, he's an average guy. I think that he'll see enough volume to be a volume king. But um, not not the not personally the biggest fan. Anyway, after that we see Gus Edwards. Uh, and this is another one that makes sense to me. Gus Edwards is a guy that you give the ball to him and he is going to run and he's going to pick up the yards, but he doesn't see the ball all that often. Um, and he's not like a featured back or a three down back. He, he will split touches with other guys. And yeah, I figure he maintains a similar role out here in LA. Maybe more touches because they're going to be. Wait, no. What am I talking about? It's, he's going from the Raven system with Greg Roman to the. Charger system with Greg Roman, and uh, even if Harbaugh's philosophy is run first, it's Greg Roman at the end of the day, so we're going to see Edwards be right here, where he always has been. Then, after that, we've got Zach Moss. Um, Zach Moss, I think he started off higher. I want to say, like, there were a couple games where he was doing really well, and then I think his efficiency plummeted, and so he ends up being an average back took over on a lot of those touches when Jonathan Taylor was out, ended up being in a similar place, and so, yeah, heading into next year, I don't love, I don't love trying to go get him, because I don't think that he provides anything of that, like, he's not all that talented, and so you're really depending on volume, and if, if you're going to have a committee anyways, try and go for the guy who's more efficient, like, if you're not, like, if you're looking at last year's Steelers backfield, why would you not try and target Jalen Warren over Harris? Like, if you're going to be volume dependent, swing, swing and miss on the other guy just to see if the volume person takes a dip. Because really, the only thing sustaining Zach Moss heading in next year is his volume. So if Chase Brown outproduces him consistently, then they'll probably give those touches away to Chase Brown, and Chase Brown will be the better back to have him. And finally, we've got Samir White, um, and this is another one that, like, makes a lot of sense to me. Samir White came in, saw a decent amount of work in those last couple games, and did his job, you know, was getting good offensive opportunities and doing exactly what was asked of him. Now, if they truly do not roll out with anyone else, I, I think I got bad info. I got bad info saying that they were, the, the Raiders were looking to bring in Fournette or Kareem Hunt, and I, nothing like that has ever materialized, so I'm going to chalk that away as a, my bad. So Samir White, though I don't think there's anything that impressive about him, he is like the lead guy in this backfield, and could be seeing enough volume to be like in the volume king conversation, but I don't figure that the Raiders offense is going to be all that good. I don't, like, love their offensive line, so I'm, I'm personally passing. There's, there's nothing drawing me in about Samir White. I would not really want him. That's just me. Anyway, uh, with that, we conclude our average territory, and we have enough time to move into our next tier, which is the overrated category, and this is a fun one. Oh, this one will be fun to talk about just because we have a lot of big names in here. And to get classified as an overrated running back from last year, you had to have had over 250 offensive opportunities, but produced eight yards per touch of below 4.5. So these are guys who saw a lot of work in the offense, but were inefficient. Like, they were not efficient guys. <laughs> and the list is quite fun. So, first up in this list, we have Derrick Henry. Uh, and Derrick Henry just barely cracks into it. I think he was at 4.48. So, just under 5. Uh, 4.5. But, as per the rules, he belongs here. And so, that, I think, can be attributed to the fact that, like, the Titans have a bum offense. And there was a lot of effort, and there's just a lot riding on Henry here and in 
just getting through the holes better or the Steelers upgrading their offensive line. I don't know what the status is on something like that, but um, if Justin Fields does take over in the quarterback department for this team, I, I think it's dangerous. I, I don't like Harris. I would not be going after Harris. Go after Warren in like a late round pick in case he takes over or something like that. Fate Harris. Um, yeah. After that, we've got Chubba Hubbard of uh, the Panthers. And yeah, this is like a Devin Singletary type thing where it's like Chubba Hubbard, they had no one better, so they're just giving him the ball. But yeah, I think everyone knew like it's not supposed to have that much offensive featuring. And that's why they went out and they got Jonathan Brooks. So hopefully Brooks can be more efficient, but this guy was just a black hole on offense. And finally, this one is so interesting to me because the last guy to round out the overrated category is Josh Jacobs. And I guess I'm just astounded because Josh Jacobs had such a good year two years ago, led the league in rushing. And then to have such a contrastingly like bad and inefficient year last year, um, just goes to show the like volatility in the running back position where you can be on top of the world and then you can be like like quite bad um and so i think it's an uphill battle for samir white because quite frankly josh jacobs is much more talented than samir white jacobs stepping into the green bay packers offense if the o-line can do better things for him then it's Like, maybe, I think he's supposed to see more pass-catching work in Green Bay, and I think that he's going to be a little more efficient, but I think that his touches go down for sure. So, Jacobs is another guy that I'm kind of weary of. I don't love uh, drafting him. I try to avoid him. Anyway, after that, we move into our second-to-last category. This is the below-average uh, category, and let me just refresh myself on what it took to qualify here below average. These are running backs that saw less than 250 opportunities and they locked uh, yards per touch between 4.5 and 4. So, um, below average is just people from the overrated category on less touches. So, this is inefficient running backs. They didn't see all that much work, um, but they just were not efficient. And so, in this category, we have uh, first up, Ramondre Stevenson. Also, kind of a a big regression in fantasy and just people for what he was doing um, to where he is now it's been it's been a, a downhill sled and Stevenson hopefully he can bounce back but I don't really think so I'm, I'm not a guy that likes honestly as a Patriots fan I hate drafting Patriots fantasy players because it's just too much cope much disappointment at this point. Uh, there's no one on the Patriots offense that I would want to go after, except for maybe Demario Douglas with, like, the last pick. Um, it's all, it's all too much of a variable. Um, and so, yeah, Stevenson, the low average in his production value, um, in his efficiency, and he just didn't see that many touches below 250, so not getting workhorse status. They brought in Gibson. They have Kevin Harris. Uh, so, don't love the running back room for him, and I, it wasn't efficient. So, what is there to like about Ramondre Stevenson, really? After that, you've got Tyler Algier. Um, and <laughs> this is funny, because he's like a thorn in Bijan Robinson's side, where, yeah, you don't want to overwork Bijan. Uh, but Algier, like, is it's just not that good him to be getting used as much as he is and for the Falcons to go out and announce that like they're, they're expecting Tyler Algier to get more goal line work it's just like it's funny um but yeah I don't think that anyone is like he's their RB2 so you're allowed that status you're allowed to be um in this category more so because you're not the featured guy on your team so it's fine he's doing the dirty work and that's that's perfectly acceptable. Then after that, we've got Alexander Madison, and this is what 
I was talking about Alexander Madison was not good last year for the Vikings. Um, tried to fill in that James Cook spot. Uh, not James Cook. Dalvin Cook. <laughs> Dalvin Cook spot. Uh, and just couldn't. Not not efficient. Uh, and so they, they stopped giving him as many touches. They, I think people were expecting him to get a lot because of how Dalvin Cook was in those previous years, but like at some point they realized like this guy is not good with the ball in his hands and they, they got rid of him and so now Oakland has him. He's gonna be playing behind some near white. Um I don't think he's gonna be adding much value. But yeah. After that we have AJ Dillon of the Green Bay Packers. Uh Dillon. I'm actually kinda surprised. I thought that he was better than he is. Um but I think that this for him. There was already reports that he's like barely making the roster and for him to be one of the most inefficient backs last year uh, just supports the theory that Marshawn Lloyd would supplant him on that depth chart. Obviously right now Marshawn Lloyd dealing with hamstring pulls and injuries so um, not not really pro drafting Marshawn Lloyd anymore. Uh, earlier I was a bit higher on him as a handcuff, um, but, yeah, and then finally, the last running back in the below average category is Ezekiel Elliott, and this is truly just sad, the fact that, like, Ezekiel Elliott will be leading the Cowboys backfield after being not efficient last year, he was one of the worst, uh, guys in terms of efficiency, and, yeah, out of the backfield as a pass catcher, he did a pretty good job, which was surprising to me, um, but he just is not the same guy anymore, and so, like, for the Cowboys to take him back, I was, like, happy for the reunion, but I can't believe that they're actually rolling out with him as the starter, so I do figure that Rico Dowdle will jump him in that depth spot, uh, depth chart, but like, what are the Cowboys doing? <laughs> Anywho, finally, this is our eighth and final category in this tier list. It is the trash category, and there's only three running backs in here. These are guys who, they posted a yard per touch of below four yards, so you're giving this guy the ball, and he will not even get four yards. Um, and that is bad. That is, like, truly bad. Everyone else in this list has either been above five yards or in between four uh, and five and so to be below four um, you're just not good as a running back and this is where we have Javante Williams of the Denver Broncos and Javante Williams yeah he has dealt with like a couple injuries here and there but maybe this is why I'm out on him I, I do not trust him um, honestly seeing him here I didn't expect him to be this low but it felt good seeing him this low because it it gave me a reason for why I don't like him in fantasy. Uh, and yeah, so I am not touching that. The fact that Denver's backfield is supposed to be like a committee, uh, I do think that they're going to be a poor team as a whole. Uh, there's no reason why I would want to target anyone out of that backfield, really. Um, especially with him being this inefficient. Then, after that, we've got Miles Sanders of the Panthers, and this we knew. Uh, he was, it was just a bad offseason addition for them. Did not do anything very well. That's why they rolled out with Chubb Hubbard as much as they did, because Sanders was so piss poor. And, yeah, uh, once again, explaining the pivot from them, I significantly, I, I think that that was significant that just, and maybe not even involve him at all, because Miles Sanders is like, he was okay on Philadelphia, he's just not good on the Panthers whatsoever, so. And finally, the worst running back in football last year was Damian Pierce, um, and truly surprising to me, just because, like, heading into last year, I thought that he was going to take over that backfield and do good things with it, and when you think about, like, how surprisingly good the Texans offense was, um, it's really in 
spite on Damian Pierce. He did not contribute to that at all. It was Devin Singletary getting a lot of touches ahead of him because he was so bad in himself. And yeah, Damian Pierce like looks to sort of behind Joe Mixon, but it I, I don't I don't think he's a threat whatsoever. And yeah. There were a couple guys that you know, they didn't have their like jersey posted in this like uh, tier, tier list that I was using, but from what I recall, Dante Foreman would have fallen in the below average category, and in the trash category, we had a couple other guys, Joshua Kelly, Kareem Hunt, and the actual worst running back last year in terms of efficiency was Jamal Williams, incredibly inefficient, but like also very underutilized. Um, and really just like sad on the Saints organizational end because he had such a good year uh, with the Lions and then they like completely broke up the backfield and I thought that he would be able to at least sustain something because like he's such a fun personality but no um, and yeah so that concludes our tier list for today that is all eight categories of 2023 running backs ranked on their efficiency uh, efficiency and volume so once again this is not a nothing to do with skill nothing to do with talent or their outlook into the next year i tried to provide notes and my takeaways mostly fantasy outlook because fantasy is coming up but yeah um as always thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this video you might have noticed me like grinning and smiling a little more because like lists like this you you don't it's not gut based at all it's just what the numbers are showing and it's so fun <laughs> i feel like um when else are you going to have a tier list where ty chandler is three three tiers above saquon barkley and derrick henry like no one is coming up with that on their own it has to be some numerical thing and yeah that could be a reason why you argue against like stats being everything uh, stats are not everything uh, this does not tell a complete picture you have no information about like their offensive line uh their injury status anything like that so this is not the end all be all but 